I want to talk to you for just a few moments about relationships and how they shape your world. I want to ask you a question. What shape is your private world in? Not your public face. You know, your public face is the one we fix up and put on. You go into work and, you know, you, you bite your tongue because you'll lose your job if you don't. So there's motivation for everything we do. But what shape is your private world in? Who are you at home? Who are you when you're alone? Who are you to those who know you the best and the most intimately? See, the, the people around us shape our lives. That's why we tell you here often, check your life team. Who's on your life team? Are they winners or losers? Are they mediocre, just get by the best way they can? Or are they people of excellence? You say, well, if I wipe my team out of everybody who's mediocre and less than I won't have anybody on my life team, well, maybe it's time for you to start rebuilding. Because we begin to look and act like those that we do life with. Now, our first life shapers were our family. Be that good, bad, or ugly. The, the family is something that you cannot choose. You were not able to choose your birth parents. And if you've been able to, you didn't have enough wisdom then to choose who you needed anyway. So two people got together and produced you with God's help. And I will go on record as saying a man and woman got together and produced you. Y'all get that at lunch when you sit down and think about this message. We are shaped by our parents, by our family. We develop our first sense of self and our identity from our family environment, no matter what that looks like. Our belief system begins with the family. We can inherit extra life baggage from circumstances in a family environment. Some things happen within that family unit that are, that are without our consent and beyond our control as a child. We grow up under the influence of imperfect people who make mistakes. And here's your newsflash. No one on earth is born to perfect parents. We're born to human parents. So if you were born into a Christian home with two Christian parents, they probably made some mistakes. Hopefully they're not fatal mistakes. But if you were born into a messed up, laced with generational curses family that have not been dealt with, then you've had some stuff poured into you that you're going to have to deal with before you become who you're supposed to be. Thank you for one person having bravery to agree with me on that. The rest of y'all just stay messed up and jacked up for the rest of your lives and we'll see y'all later. Anybody had to deal with some stuff? Oh, there's about 20 honest people now. I'm going to ask you again. Anybody had to deal with some stuff? See, it doesn't matter what family you're born into, there are barriers in place in every family. If your family never owned a home and you decide you're going to be a homeowner and you're going to be debt free, you got some barriers to cross to get there. Doesn't mean you have to own a home to be successful. But if you decide that that's one of your goals, you're going to have to climb over some walls in that family to get there. If you decide you want to drive a certain car and you want it to be paid for and not repossessed. 
and that's never happened in your family, then you got to crawl over some walls to get there. If you decide to be a God-fearing, America-loving, and respectful person, and you were raised with people who spew poison out of their mouth because my skin color is not the same as yours, you're going to have to climb over some walls to become a different person. You're going to have to erase some lines in your life and let somebody else in that looks different than you. It's, there's, there's barriers in every family that if you decide to do something a little different and to go a little further and a little higher, you may not be celebrated in a dysfunctional family. Let's bring it on home now. We live in a world of blamers. It is your fault that life has not gone well for me. That is the, the song of America. I don't really know how we got here. But we have raised and become people that blame somebody else for what I don't have. When there are people who are not from this country, who come to this country legally, and they become very successful, yet you have Americans who are born and raised here that want a handout. Pastor will be back next Sunday, so just, it'll be okay. But we live in a world of, I don't have what I need because you've not given me what I need. We need to stop focusing on blame and dysfunction. Baby, you need to look at your neighbor and say, dysfunction has always been with us and it will always be here. We have an epidemic in America, it's called stupidity. It is a disease that's wiping us out. Just get you a Facebook account for 30 days. And I never cease to be amazed. I'm like, oh my God. You, you, really, you really put that in, in print like forever. How stupid. How stupid are you? You know, people, husband and wives blow my mind on social media. Y'all act like you don't sleep in the same house together. And you put all this warm, fuzzy, hoochie-coochie. I'm like, do that stuff in your bedroom. I do not want to read it. But what I've learned is if you got to throw some shade and act like your life is the most great it ever is, let me come to your house for a few days. You know, I don't have to get on Facebook and tell you how amazing Steve Ball is. But I need to look at his face and tell him. Just my pet peeve. Maybe you want to know all that about people. I don't want I don't. Get a room. We need to stop focusing on blame and dysfunction. We need to find, I don't care how offbeat and dysfunctional that your family is. Because if they were, they probably still is. That's great English, isn't it? Find something positive in your family and thank God for it. It can be, thank God I got out. It can be, thank God I got out alive. Most of us have been through some tough times. But so have your parents. And sometimes... Children find it hard to give their parents some slack. Even in Christian homes, we're critical of our parents. But you, you, you have to kind of grow up to realize, okay, they're people too. And, and just because you become a parent, God knows, doesn't mean you got your act together. It just means you, you father or you birthed a child. We need to deal constructively with the damage that has been done. Anybody had some damage in your life? We could probably all raise our hands. We've probably all caused some damage. 
but we've got to learn how to deal with the damage and ongoing issues. The sad truth is, in some of your family relationships, those issues may never, ever go away. Because the people who have carried those issues have made a decision not to do anything about them and not to be a better person. So you have got to deal constructively with those issues that may never go away. But I want to ask you a question. When will you take responsibility for reshaping your world? Now, that's five of y'all going to do that. We're going to have a great church, Pastor. The experts, not the church people, not the theologians, but the, the secular experts tell us, the psychological experts tell us, that we can blame other people on what's happened to us until we're about 25 years old. And from that point on, baby, it's on us. Yet we got some 45-year-old men, some 52-year-old women, still acting like toddlers. Don't say something didn't happen to you, I'm not denying that. But at some point, we need to turn a corner and leave the crap behind. Job 14.1 says, how frail is humanity, how short is life, and how full of trouble. And the church said, oh, Jesus, yes. But John 16.33 says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Peace in the midst of your human frailty. Peace in the midst of your short life. Peace in the midst of all a life that's full of trouble. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the shape that your world is in. Wow. So I want to give you just a bit of good news today. You can come out of a damaged environment and live a productive and healthy life. And you can live a different life and you can make a difference in somebody else's life. It is possible. The people that we, now your family, we cannot choose. You got to choose what to deal with that once you get here on the earth. But the people that we choose to follow will determine to a large degree who we become. I put a picture of a potter's wheel up there. And if you've ever studied the potter and the clay process, it's a difficult process. It's a squishing, smashing, hot, sit on a shelf for a minute process until you become a vessel of honor that when you're thumped, if, if you thud, if a potter creates a vessel and, and he's gone through the entire process and thumps that vessel, if it thuds, it goes back in the fire. Woo. Has God thumped you lately? He's thumped me lately. But if that vessel sings, he's ready for use. So we got some choices to make. See, in our lives, we need role models. We need mentors. We need teachers. We need spiritual fathers and mothers. We need big brothers and big sisters. We need friends. We need heroes. We need cheerleaders. Now, those don't all have to be a separate person. You might find one person in your life that can be all of that. But this is how you build your life team. You need a role model that you can pattern after. So you need somebody on your life team that's been through a thing, they got through it, and they're better off for it. You don't need your life team filled with people. If, if you're a, a divorced woman and, and you're frustrated and you find yourself hating men and you lap the same mountain, then don't put 12 divorced, unhappy women on your life team. You 
You know, if, if you're a, quote, recovering alcoholic, you probably need to come to the altar and get recovered completely, I'm just saying. But you don't fill your life with people who go to the bar. Who's on your life team? A mentor. You need a teacher. You know, I get amused in the body of Christ because they'll say, oh, you're my spiritual mama. Then they're gone in 30 days. You will not have multiple spiritual fathers and multiple spiritual mothers. It's popular in the body of Christ. But it's not biblical. Some things that are popular you can't prove in his word. See, if you want to reshape your world, you have to start and take initiative to connect. If you want a mentor or a role model or a teacher in your life or a spiritual father or mother, it is not their obligation to reach out and find you. You will have to take initiative and make time to connect. God typically starts with the people he's already placed around you. And he expands from there. So, you know, well, well, God, I don't like who you've put in my life. You know, they're, they're too hard on me. He'll probably start with who's in your life and expand from there. Your life growth requires seeking advice. Not only seeking it, but following wise advice. Some influencers in your life have lived before you. Get their books, read, listen. Learn from some of the greats. Shaping your world requires your time. See, because we do what is important to us. You say, well, I don't have time. It's because you don't want to have time. I don't have time for you. It's because you don't want to have time. I don't have time to do that. It's because you don't want to. And if you, I've learned in, in life, if you want to find somebody who will get something done, find a busy person. People who, ha, who do nothing don't have any time. They, they, just, can't, they just can't get to it because they got their sweet tea in their recliner. They probably won't have a heart attack. They're the ones who cause them. <laughs> See, it's all about relationships. Elijah and Elisha. You can read about them in 2 Kings chapter 2. They walked together as a spiritual father and a spiritual son relationship. Elisha had to be persistent in following Elijah. When you find a great role model, they are difficult to follow because they are perpetually raising the bar. You know, I was raised by amazing parents. They're champion, they were champions. They were bar raisers all the time. I remember a conversation I had with my dad many years ago before he passed away. I said, I, I feel like I'm perpetually chasing the carrot and I never get it. And he was so shocked. He said, baby, why would you? I said, why would I feel that way? Because when you get close, the goal moves. So if you find an Elijah, they're probably difficult to follow. See, Elisha had to choose to see Elijah. Pastor has often said, you don't have my vision if you don't see what I see. See, if you can walk through this building and not see a piece of trash on the carpet, you don't have his vision. It can be everything distracts him. Everything. I mean, just, it can be a, a, a flick of something. And the staff says, yes, Lord. See, Elisha, because of his persistence in following Elijah, Elisha got a, he got Elijah's mantle when Elijah left this earth, the mantle of that great man fell on Elisha's shoulders. 
not just a mantle, but the Bible says a double portion of what Elijah had. So you have to pay a price to follow an Elijah. Great people like Elijah can sometimes be hard to follow. Then we have the example of Moses and Joshua. You can read about this in Exodus. Joshua was only able to follow in Moses' footsteps because in the moments when God was speaking face to face with Moses, Joshua was there. And he learned what communicating with a creator looked like. He learned what mistakes looked like. He learned what instruction looked like. He learned what discipline looked like. So he was able to follow in Moses' steps because of that. Then we see David and Solomon. Solomon is known as what? The wisest man. Do you know why? Because his father urged him to pursue understanding. So when you got a father like David, who's got a history, they probably had some nice talks. But Solomon became known as the wisest of wise. Then there's Paul and Timothy. You can read about their story in 2 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, Philippians, all, during the, all through the New Testament. Timothy was encouraged as a young pastor despite life difficulties because he submitted to Paul's example and his advice. All of these relationships require submission on both parts, on both sides of the fence. You submit to a thing called covenant. You submit in the times when you're being corrected. And your pastor and I have had many, many moments of that with our spiritual father, my dad, role model, mentor, life coach, whatever he was in our lives. He was all that in a bag of chips. But you talk about paying a price in some conversations. And then there were huge rewards. But see, Steve Ball made the mistake. Oh, Jesus. I very well remember the conversation. He said, Papa, I want you to mentor me. I don't want you to ever sugarcoat it. Don't put a cherry on top. And I'm like, you just met this man. You have no wisdom in that statement you just made. Because most of his words are not real sugary coated coated anyway and you give him permission to take all the sugar off of it you have a strong pastor then we can look at the example of Naomi and Ruth and there's an entire book in the Bible entitled Ruth it's a beautiful beautiful story Ruth chose to submit to Naomi as her spiritual mother who was who really was Naomi in Ruth's life her who her who? Her mother-in-law. Well, who would have figured that? Interesting. But she, ch she saw more in Naomi than a mother-in-law. And she submitted to her as a spiritual mom. And she said, where you go, I'm going. Through the good, through the bad, I'm going with you. I'm going to follow your lead. And because she did, both Naomi and Ruth walked in tremendous blessing and favor because Ruth chose to submit to a spiritual mama. Then we look at the relationship of Mordecai and Esther. You know, Esther is, is the queen in the Bible. And, and we often use that, that scripture, you know, you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. She would never have had her such a time as this had she not submitted to her, I think he was her uncle, Mordecai. She had to go through craziness. She was the first contestant on The Bachelor. She had to move into a palace with I don't know how many women vying for the favor of one man. That makes great TV. It's not good living. And they had to be 
you know, trained and, and, and all of this. And, she, and to deal with all those women. Shh, man, don't say anything. Don't poke her in the ribs. But her Mordecai in her life spoke strong words to her. And he became her life coach and her mentor and her spiritual father. And because she could have bailed and run. But they had such a relationship that his mentorship over her life, he basically said, what do you have to lose? Go in before the king. And she took her, she risked her very life to follow that man's instructions. And because she did, and because of his connection and their connection and her trust in his words and wanting what was the best for her, she took a life risk and saved her nation. But that would have never happened if she hadn't had a mentor in her life. Someone who is outside looking in and assessing the situation. And she's known today as a world changer. Then we see where Jesus had 12 disciples. 12 men who followed closely with him for three years. One of them didn't do so well. There'll always be a, a, a betrayer in your group somewhere. But that betrayer teaches you things. That betrayer teaches you how to let a thing go when a thing walks away. It teaches you to, to dig down inside of your soul and figure out who you are besides what the mess that's coming out their mouth. So because these 12 men followed him, they became world changers and they changed our world. Look to your neighbor and say, it's all about relationship. See, when, when you come to a place, you say, God, help me understand the purpose of the people that you've put in my life. You know, you may say, God, help me understand why you have placed me here at Metro Tab. If you understand why he put you here, you don't get offended. See, if you have parents, whether they're earthly parents or spiritual parents, they correct. It is second nature. And all the mamas said, oh, you have to bite your lips sometimes, don't you, mama? When they're, especially when they're adult children. Sometimes that blood starts running down inside your face. You're biting that tongue. It's like, oh, Jesus, I raised you better than this. But parents correct. Prophets confront. I need to tell you whether you know this or not, this is a very prophetic house. Coaches push. Anybody had a coach in your life? Five of y'all been on ball teams? Ever? No men have had coaches in your life. If you had a coach in your life, raise your hand. Do they ever push you? I often wonder what happens in those teams you watch play on TV and they haven't had such a first good first half. Because there's different coaching styles. There's some coaches going to just jump down your throat till you gag. And there's others who are life coaches. And they, they go down in your, your belly and they pull out that good stuff in you. They pull out that, that thing that caused you to fight the good fight. That, 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 that thing that caused you to dig deep in who you are and give more than what you thought you could give. That's what a coach does. And most of those coaches and their teams succeed. Berating coaches don't have such great careers. Sometimes. So if, if there are parents, spiritual parents in your life, you have to understand the role of who God has put in your life. See, your spiritual father may not be your best friend. Your spiritual mama may not be your best friend. Your coach may not be your best friend. Your mama may not be your best friend. They really are. You just may not think they are. Because they're not, you know, patting you on the back and saying, oh, it's okay. Sometimes it is okay, and sometimes you need a pat on the back, but sometimes you need a kick in the butt. You know, maybe you need both. You need to do this and get a pat at the same time. 
that was kind of my life and my family. Like, okay, I think you think I'm okay, but something's kicking me here. In Psalm 37, 23, we read these words. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Another translation, in the Phillips translation, the Passion translation, the steps of the God-pursuing ones follow firmly in the footsteps of the Lord. And God delights in every step they take to follow him. See, we often say, oh, my steps are ordered by the Lord. But they will not be unless you order your steps to follow him. Yes, it's his desire to order your steps. But the strongest force on the earth is your will. God will not force you. Now, if you've got a grandma or mama praying for you, he's probably going to get your attention at some point. And you probably don't need him to get your attention. It's easier just to line up and march. But I love that translation, that the steps of the God-pursuing ones follow firmly in the footsteps of the Lord. So we need to connect with life-changing world shapers if we're going to change the shape that our world is in right now. So here's how you reshape your world. First of all, you check your life priorities. That is foundational. What is priority to you? What is the most important thing to you? Then you learn, you grow by listening to what others say, listening to what he says, listening to his word, and watching. You can learn a lot by watching people. If they have run their life in a ditch, learn from it. If their life is a disaster, learn from it. If their life, life is a success, listen and learn. Emulate what they do. We should be reshaping our world so we can say to someone behind us, Oh, follow me as I follow Christ. Walk in forgiveness. Put away anger, which requires walking in self-discipline. Keep healthy boundaries. Another translation of that in my world is keep the junk out. Be careful what you let through the gates of your life. Who has the right to speak into your life? What junk are you allowing into your life? Get some healthy boundaries. Be teachable. Give grace and mercy every day. Walk in peace. Just be nice, America. Just be nice. We are living in a crazy day. In a media-driven society that is feeding on negative False stories, sensationalism. Be careful what you let into your spirit and what you respond to. You should become a person that if this world goes to hell in the handbasket, I'm not going. And I'm not going to let some, some other person or opinion change what I know is true in His Word. How I'm supposed to act, how I'm supposed to respond, how I'm supposed to live. And the truth is, most of us have this in our hands and not this. Not trying to be ugly. What was the first thing you reached for this morning? What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep? You, you, you check it. Who's called me? Who sent me a text? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just click on Facebook and, and see what's happening. I'm going to hit my Instagram account. And this has become our guide. And when 
you spend less time in this and more time in this, then your responses become not Christ-like. They become reactionary and dark and opinionated. Maybe everybody's got one. If I threw this mic in this congregation right now, I could get some of y'all so angry, so angry because of who you voted for, how you act, what you like to eat. We could just start a turf war right here because there's some differences in this room. Be not deceived, Metro Tab. There are some differences in this house. We're not a country club where we scream, where you got to have a certain amount of, you know, money and, and a certain skin tone to get in here. But, you know, we try to spend more time here than here. And when you, you spend more time here, then all this stuff looks a lot different. When I'm going through a thing in life, this is not what I need. This is what I need. I don't need man's opinion. I don't need man's anger. I don't need social media. I need a God that I adore to come talk to me. I need a God that has peace to come bring me peace. I need a God that knows how to anoint me to be a different person, to be a better mom and a better wife and a better person. I need the God of the universe to visit my home, to ride in my car with me, to go to work with me, to help me raise my babies, to help me say to somebody, you can follow me because I'm doing my best to follow him. And you got to be wise enough to say, if I say to Rob, follow me as I follow Christ, and I mess up, I say, baby, I, I, I'm sorry. My response was wrong. I'm about to get this thing back on track. You live a life of accountability, a life of openness, a life of peace. You just, you just treat people nice, and that requires shutting your mouth. It's just a simple exercise. Let's try it. Everybody open their mouth. Now close it. See how simple that was? But when that stuff is churning on the inside of you and all you have done is spend time with this, it shows. It shows. So give grace and mercy. Walk in peace. Our, our, our earth is groaning for an anointing. Our earth is groaning for somebody to put its arms around. See, we are earthlings. You're going to find a piece of earth this week in your life that will walk up with you to you with, you know, with eyes and a nose and ears and legs and arms. A piece of God's earth that will need you to treat them kindly. Live in covenant, which requires submission. You know, submission is simply getting under the mission of another person. We've made it so much else. I read a thing a few years back talking to women that submission is this. It's just ducking so God can hit your husband. Sorry. <laughs> I try ducking instead of fussing and brawling and arguing all the time. So I want to say this statement to you. If we can't walk in covenant with a flawless God, there is no way that we can walk in covenant with imperfect humans. 
got to get this thing right first. How easy it is to walk in covenant with a flawless God. When we, we, when we start mastering that relationship, then walking in covenant with you becomes so much easier. Because I realize you're His creation too. And you're His gift to the earth too. So here's what I want to leave you with. Let's just connect. We need to connect with God. We need to connect with others. You can start right here in this house. There are some amazing people in this house. Amazing people with amazing life stories and amazing testimonies. So start today. Connect here today. And connect in service so you can sell someone. Follow me as I follow Christ.